I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swam Podcast. Joining me today, we have a very special guest. We got a Hall of Famer. He's in the International Swimming Hall of Fame. He's in the International Swim Coaches Association Hall of Fame. USA Swimming named him among the 30 most influential people in the sport. He's the founder of PDR, Philadelphia Department of Recreation, a.k.a. Pride, Determination, Resilience, He's a man with 50, we're we're debating what it is. I think it's 50, 50 plus years of experience in the sport. And he's the only coach that has a Hollywood feature film that's been made about him. Talking about Pride from 2007. We're going to put that in the show notes if you don't know anything about that. Today, we have Coach Jim Ellis. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing fine, Mel. How about yourself? You're a sweetheart. You played host to Coleman Hodges, our head of production. You had him on deck. He did a practice and pancakes. And he he was called me pretty excited after he captured it. We're going to use some of that footage and we're going to cut it into this video to give some to give some of our listeners and the people watching on video uh, some more flavor. What so how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, I'm here with you. I mean, swim swam. I mean, what else can I say? It's uh, it's I, I I got my Jim Ellis hug at Olympic trials. I got to see you, and yeah. I would and I would say that when they honored you on deck, it was one of the it was it was you know they do such a great job at trials and they personalize it and they give us the stories. But when you know you get the when they honored you standing ovation, that was a, that was a very meaningful moment. I think it was a, one of the high points of trials, and I'm I'm just glad that I was there to witness that history. How did that feel? Uh, I was like a deer in the headlights, really. It's, uh, it was at trials. Uh, like you said, it was a great production, fantastic. And I hadn't been in trials in a while. And so this was the new trials. So I was taking it all in. And then also to have a swimmer there, hoping that uh, they would do a good show and uh, really kind of put us in the spotlight as well. Uh, so I had a lot of things going through my mind uh, at the time. Uh, it was good that Brendan Hansen was on the deck, kind of loosened me up a little bit. Uh, but uh, it, 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 it was a, a memorable moment. Very. Well, the, uh, so I'm going to pull context into into this conversation and and say that I'm a child of the 1970s. Um, you know, my age group years really started hitting. They started bumping in the late 70s and into the 80s. And I made the Olympic team in 88, went on in 92. I knew of you. And everybody knew who you were, everyone, you know, but I, in my head, you were just this great coach and I knew your swimmers and I knew the names of the swimmers. And, um, uh, I, I didn't know that you were a black man. I didn't know. What? Yeah, no kidding. It was just like, this is this guy's this great coach here, here is swimmers. And we, I was reading all the stats. I had no idea growing up in North Carolina in the 1970s and, and being socialized and educated there. It was, um, it was a surprise. It was unexpected. I remember seeing you the first time on deck and I was like, wow, it was, it was a new experience for me. And, um, the kids today probably don't understand that, but it's, uh, it was a very different time. Yeah. Yeah, it was the, uh, in, in terms of, in terms of your experience, can you take me back to, um, the founding of PDR and, and, and just what was going through your mind as, as a young coach, starting this program and you know what were you what was the mission what what was your what was your mission statement at that time uh, i guess i had several things uh, the opportunity came to coach i was uh finishing up college and um, they dropped the team at cheney university and someone uh young lady said her mother was supervisor of a new rec center that had an indoor swimming pool so long story short, I went in the city, saw the facility. I said, how can I get a job here? They said, you need to take a civil service test, took the test, passed the test. They said, well, you're number one or two on the list. You can get a job. And I got the job and uh, I had my water safety instructor certification when I was 16, when I left Pittsburgh. And um, 
so I was teaching swimming a little bit at college and I got this job and started teaching swimming. And my, my thing was, this is great. This, this is nice. And the culture in Philadelphia at the time, it was uh, the neighborhood I was in was gangs. The, the, the gangs were in there tough. And if you went across the wrong street, you're in the wrong territory. You know, you're in someone else's uh, territory. And I thought that was a little ludicrous. I'd never seen anything like that. And uh, I said, this is a waste. So one of the things was starting the team to get kids out of that culture. The other thing was we're teaching so many kids how to swim. They get their certificate. They go home. You never see them again. So once they learn to swim at eight, seven, nine, you want to keep them swimming. So what better than a swim team? And the other issue is swimming was good to me. I enjoyed it so much. I enjoyed uh, just part of it. I wasn't a great swimmer. I was pretty good. Uh, my high school team was pretty good. We weren't bad. And um, I just it just took me somewhere else when I was swimming. You, you just were like on another planet or whatever. And so I wanted other kids to enjoy that experience. I could bring that to them. And uh, so I had an opportunity and I started a team and uh, took kids out of swim classes. And uh, your man, Trevor, was one of those kids and his brother. And uh, we had a couple other families. And once I got finished, uh, Trevor and his brother were still around. So we, we went on that journey with a few other kids. Uh, and that was in 1971. We originally started as SARE Aquatic Club. That's S-A-Y-R-E. And uh, that was the name of the rec center. And we, we did that for uh, until 1980 when the city built another pool. And um, again, took the test so I could move on and step up the ladder, get a different uh, classification. I scored one or two on the test again. They said, here's the keys. You're, it's a brand new pool. We went in the summer of 1980. Some people followed me from West Philadelphia, where we were at. And um, it was my joint. I said, this is it. I uh, didn't have to report to anybody on site. My supervisor was somewhere else. And uh, so I was allowed to do whatever I wanted to do to create a program. So I met with community people, told them what I was doing. And everybody was going to benefit from us having the pool if they just followed the program. And um, it's, the rest was history. Um, and uh, like I said, I started the program in 1971. And my whole goal when starting a program, I'll go back a little bit, was not to just have an inner city program. There, there were plenty of those around. And I said, what can I do that's unique and different? Well, the number one thing, because in growing up, uh, there were black swimmers that were successful, but they were not role models in the community because uh, a white or suburban team came in, recruited them, they disappeared, you never saw them again. So uh, if you weren't traveling in that circle, you didn't see them. So my, my goal was, hey, I'm going to start a team that's going to be nationally, internationally uh, viable. That's it. That's my goal. We're, we're going to nationals. You know, that's the whole concept of this team is nationals. Uh, I'm setting the bar high. I'm looking for excellence. I'm going to demand excellence. And that's what we're going to do. Set a five-year plan. Took me 10 years to get it. Uh, and Trevor Freeland, is, as you know, was my first national level qualifier. And then he went off to UVA. Mark Bernardino took him in. And when Trevor left, I turned around, went to my age groupers. Next man up, let's go. And uh, the ball got rolling. And PDR was officially started. While you're fixing, while you're while you're, while you're checking your phone there and silencing your ringer, the uh, let's let me let me just come in and give everyone context on Trevor Vreeland. Um, there are probably five people on Earth, planet Earth, that understand the sport of swimming in terms of the data and metri metrics and the history. Uh, I'd say that you know it, a lot of people assume our editor in chief and co-founder of Swim Swimmer, Braden Keats, one of those guys. Mike Unger at USC Swimming Forum, you know, COO, he's going to be at the international governing body as their, their head of development. But Trevor Vreeland, never, never really a job in swimming. He's a, he's a Deutsche Bank. He's a managing director at Deutsche Bank. Uh, he lives the lifestyle I think we all want to live. Um, but, uh, right, you know, UVA undergrad, Duke MBA, 
uh, and, and he's been fabulously successful. But I talked to Trevor and Trevor knows everything. And before this interview, I, I shared with Jim before, but I'm going to tell everyone here. I, I said, I said, you know, can you help me out? I need some background. I need some stories on, you know, some good questions for Jim that really give us some insight. And he sent me so much information. I thought my head was going to explode. <laughs> and I was like, Trevor, I'm just not that smart, buddy. <laughs> You said, Jim, Jim will walk you through it. So, Jim, you have to walk me through it. You got to walk me through it. It's, he sends his love. I just I got off the phone with him yeah. before I talked to you. He sends okay. his love. He sends his brother love. Um, but that's interesting. It's, and, and he is he's a part of. So let's there, there, a lot of people will come to know you through the film and just let's it's an elephant in the room. Let's talk about it. Um, you know, I. It's a, I saw the film. If you're out there and you're in your swim club, you're a coach, and this, you know, this, this is something that needs to be a part of the pantheon. The sport needs to be a part of your consciousness. You need to see it. It's entertaining. It's a lot of fun. Terrence Malick wasn't good and looking enough, the lead, to play Jim. We should have got, a, we, I, I was, we should have got Denzel. Well, I asked for Denzel. He, he was doing something else. They said he was unavailable. So they, they came up with Terrence Howard. And I said, well, let me think about that one for a minute. And uh, so I, I went and got some videos that Terrence Howard was in and got some popcorn and started watching them. And uh, all of a sudden I watched this video, Hustle and Flow, or something like that. And I saw, I said, whoa, this guy's OK. He can do this. He understands. And so Terrence Howard, then I didn't know he was local at the time. And then they said Bernie Mac was going to be in it. And uh, so it kind of took off. I didn't think it was going to happen, but. Uh, yeah, you're right. I did ask for Denzel, you know, <laughs> I was just, I'm just fishing. I, I, I think everybody asked for Denzel. I would ask for Denzel. Yeah. yeah. They're making a movie on Mel Stewart. Can Denzel be the lead forever <laughs> forever? Everybody wanted Denzel, but uh, yeah. Terrence did a great job. It's uh, it, it is, it is a great piece of entertainment, a great piece. It's, 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 it's great narrative, but Hollywood is Hollywood. And I, I, I have a background in entertainment. I was a development writer at the studios, sci-fi channel. I know that there's, you know, there's things that are left on the editing room floor and they also change, they condense history. They change things to, so they can condense this enormous narrative into two hours. Right. Is there any piece that they left out that you'd like, you know, I wish that they would have st- I wish that they would have made this a point. They'd have made this a plot point. Is there is there any 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 message there? Anything that they that you would wanted to have seen that wasn't in the film? That's a great question uh, because uh, when we were talking about it, when I met with people from Lionsgate, you know, um, I think the biggest thing is when the team went from basically 100 percent African American to 50 50, where we became diverse. So for me, uh, Pride 2 would have people leaving the, the team that uh, we were swimming against. And uh, they had a lot of smart remarks would say, wait a minute, these kids just won this championship. Maybe we need to swim with them. And they would come over and the team would become diverse. I, I think that even when the movie was made in 2007, it would have been very impactful, even more so today with uh, social justice issues coming up, uh, to have that uh, in the film and achieve the things that we achieved, uh, I think would have been very impactful. So that, that, that's probably the only thing that um, uh, I missed. And other than that, uh, instead of you know a local championship in Baltimore, we were at nationals. You know, we nationals was the thing. You know, and. Uh, so, so I guess that was it. Other than that, um, it was entertaining, and it's the only ever, it's the only swimming movie that's ever been made. You know, and uh, I didn't know that. And and it's done well, and it, and, it, and it's it's great entertainment. Once again, uh, press pause, uh, go into the show notes, check this film out. I'll tell you where where to to read the bios on it, where to check out the information, and also where you can rent it or or stream it. Um, right. I want to get to I want to and. and off of that, I want to get into some of, some of the questions in the background that, that Trevor gave me because it, it's it's on this topic. But before I get there, I mean, you, you said it yourself, and you got to bring it up. It's it's another elephant in the room. We had a really big moment in terms of just I think everyone coming to we had our come to Jesus moment uh, in the middle of the pandemic, 
where everyone had to stop and think when 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 floyd was murdered when george when right and it was uh so if you're you know you you if, if you're if you're particular if you're a white person you, you're you're reviewing everything in your life you're reviewing what you were taught what you were you know what your experience was and uh you know the first reaction was you were, you were sad that that we were even at this place this far into the future um i can't imagine your experience and I, I don't even know if it's if it, i don't even know if i feel right about asking you about it but it's like you're you're a leader in your community what sort of context can you add to that having your background and your history well it was it was a very impactful uh, situation and what made it impactful it was live in the living color you know that's what it was it wasn't a tape it wasn't a tape that was doctored it was live so people got to see it and then what people took away from it was what people wanted to take away from it what their conscience was going to let them take away from it nothing we could do about that other than say maybe people walk around with their eyes wide open now. And again, um, far as my team goes, uh, and I think uh, with the number of uh, white families that joined our program and had to travel uh, with the team, because with a black head coach and over 50% of the athletes being African-American or people of color, they looked at us as a black swim team. It started that way, and that's the way they looked at it. And uh, the people who who left other programs, who could have swum anywhere else, that came to the program and diversified the team, uh, they got the picture. Their parents understood the situation. They understood the culture in America. They wanted their children to experience uh, something else and see how the other half lived. Uh, and uh, so I was saying, well, Maybe this is the time. Maybe they'll get it at this time. Uh, because one of the most important things to me that happened in our career, maybe Trevor didn't tell you this, is that uh, I got a call from a uh, Solitar coach, uh, VJ Molesky, uh, down in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia. We used to swim down there quite a bit because of the pools they had down there, the access to 295, getting down 95. It was easier to get there than traveling around Pennsylvania. And we, we travel there for a lot of other reasons. But I got a call from him. He said, Jim, I want to come to Philly in the fall and uh, train with your team. We have a meet and, uh, you know, we get to see Philadelphia. And I said, fantastic. I said, um, I'll send you some hotels uh, that, that are close to our facility that will work around the restaurants in Philadelphia and uh, we'll make it happen. He said, well, no, 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 no. We want our kids to stay with your kids. <laughs> I said, what? And I, I had to, I had him repeat it. I said, we, he said, we want your kid, our kids to stay with your kid. I said, I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. And uh, I had my parent meeting and I presented the idea to them and I explained who they were, uh, what their demographics, their social economic situation was, and they wanted to stay in our homes. And we had a very diverse, you know, uh, team. And the parents said, okay. So I called him back. I said, it's a go. So they came to Philadelphia. We split the kids up based on age groups and so forth. We swam, had a great weekend. They exchanged gifts and they left Philadelphia. Well, in the spring, they reciprocated. We went to Fairfax and we stayed in their homes, separated, swam, had a great time. That was one of the most impactful things in swimming. If social media was around at the time, we, we probably would have made more of an impact on a lot of people. But I know the swimmers that were part of those two teams at that time uh, really uh, took a lot away from that experience. That really made me feel great that we were making some kind of impact. And that was outside of the pool, not just in the pool. That was outside of the pool. Here you are staying in someone else's home. They didn't know you. Okay. And so I, I thought that was major for that to happen. So with the Floyd thing, I said, well, maybe people will get it. And maybe this is a moment where PDR was ahead of its time, but PDR still stands for the same thing. I said, we'll continue and maybe the narrative will change. It's, uh, 
Fairfax is very swanky. It's a, it's a swanky location. People don't, people don't know what that's like. Fairfax is pretty nice. <laughs> well, let me say this for people who don't know. Uh, Fairfax is in the top five richest communities in the country. Let, let me say that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they maybe slipped a little bit, but at the time they were up there. Does that speak for itself? It speaks for itself. I, I, I swear. You remember Frankie Bell at what, J- JMY? She was my age group coach in North Carolina. But okay. my, my parent, I, I swam. We didn't pay to go. We couldn't afford it. So I, I was a scholarship swimmer from the age of six on. Right. And uh, growing up in North Carolina, and it was, uh, wow, that's, that's a lot of context there. But going to Mercersburg was, it was a big change. And I didn't understand that, that community and, and wealth and, uh, it's, it's, it's eye opening. But I think the one thing about swim is that, uh, the sports are language. It pulls us together. It crosses right. uh, socioeconomic lines. Right, 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 right. Well, we try, it is an expensive sport. And I also knew that I had to be creative to make it happen. And coming out of college, uh, at the time product of the sixties, taking over the administration buildings and looking for change. Uh, I didn't want to go to jail, so I had to come up with something where I could put my stamp on my contribution to creating change in the country. What could I do as an individual? And swimming was my first love. And so therefore it had to be through swimming that this was going to happen. And so that's the road that I took and chose coming out of college, not thinking that I would do it for 50 years. I thought I'd do it for a while educate a few people, expose them to a few things, move on, graduate school. Well, I went to graduate school, started teaching school, and just, it, it just, it was in my blood, you know? I was doing what I love, and I love what I was doing, so what else was there? Uh, that was it, and so we moved forward with the program. When I asked you about uh, the <clears throat> the difference between what we see in the, in, in the Hollywood film and what you would hope that they would show, you, you brought up the fact that, that your, your aspirations and your achievements were always, we're going to nationals. We're, we're, we're right. going national. Right. Uh, I love that. Uh, I, I, that's, I think that would have been, that would have, I would like to have seen that in that film. Um, but when I, when I asked the, the question about what I thought your answer was going to be, they didn't show me, <laughs> they didn't show PDR working them hard enough and long enough. We need to show more work. I thought that was going to be your answer. Well, that, that's what I said to people who wanted to, uh, to do a story on us. Uh, I said, look, we don't need the human interest story. Uh, they, what do you mean by that? Well, you come here because you got these black kids swimming. I said, we wanna, I said, I want you to tell the same story you tell about Mike, Michael Phelps. What do you tell about Michael Phelps? He trains 365 days a year. He swims all day. He eats a dozen eggs in the morning, comes home, he swims again. I said, tell that story. I, I said, that's just, I said, we get it in here. I said, we didn't get lucky to get these national records or win or go to juniors or go to seniors or qualify. We train. I said, and so if you don't want to speak about that, then I don't think we need to do the interview. So it came to that to one point. I just felt that we weren't. And the program, when I say we, because I didn't get there by myself, there were families that had to buy into what I was selling. There were families who had to commit uh, to the training that I was asking of them. And because I, I, when they joined the program, I said, this is a way of life. This is not a drop off program after school. program. No, this is a training program. It, it's going to be a way of life. And, uh, this is how we're going to achieve success. So I just felt that was a message that wasn't heard enough and, uh, around the country and, uh, trying to also get a lot of other young programs to follow in my footsteps that they would understand what it was. And if it was in print, they might believe it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I said that to the media I and mean, the movie people that I, we were just on another, another thing at the time, because first I didn't think the movie really was going to get made. But for folks out there who don't understand how the studio system and how movies work, they, they, the average development time, from when they buy the project and start writing the story and, 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 and pulling together time, the average time from that point to it actually making the screen is seven years. And 99% of those movies in development 
don't get made. So the yeah. fact that it did get made is um, it's like lightning striking. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it was. The time frame was less than seven years. And uh, like I said, there was another incident when I was kind of like speechless, uh, just like, wow, it's happening. Wow. Really? Wow. And then at the Golden Goggles, when we did a preview, USA Swimming preview the Golden Goggles, I was really done. Uh, and uh, we were out in California at the time. So I was in that room. Yeah, that was unique. That was very unique. There, there, there was yeah. a beautiful theater in downtown Los Angeles, that little that, that screening room. Yes, gorgeous. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it, it, that's got to feel good to be honored that way. And it, it's, it's got to be so unusual, though, to see your narrative on the big screen. That's uh, what, what does that feel like? Unbelievable. Uh, my students in school, I, I was still teaching school, math teacher. So I kind of broke the story to the students once someone said they were going to make a movie, kids found out. And um, one of my students said, well, Mr. Ellis, usually they don't make a movie about you until you're dead. And so from that day on, I pinched myself every day until the movie <laughs> came out. Just uh, it was profound. I told her, I said, I need to flunk you for saying that. I don't know. Maybe I'll give you an A, but. Uh, they laughed at it and uh, they enjoyed it, but they also got behind me and they were very supportive here. They didn't swim. They, they, and they, they just said, well, this is what you do after school. Yes. And um, so anytime that I was out because of a big meet, I had no problem with them in the classroom with a substitute, no problem with them learning the material. Uh, and I said, I didn't get here by myself. A lot of people supported me in Philadelphia to get where I got and uh, for me to have what I have, even to this day. Let's get back to the success. Let's get back to this raw, the, the raw moments of the, you accomplished it. Uh, Trevor, in, in, in terms of his notes and in terms of, in terms of moments that he sent me, it was, uh, it was as if I was talking to an excited 15-year-old kid who has who has 150 IQ? <laughs> um, it, it, he's he said, you know, ask Jim. He goes, start with this. He goes, ask him about the get out swims. Does he can, does he have any get out swim stories? Do you have any get out swim stories for us? Well, we had a lot. I mean, it's just we get to practice and we're training and and just like, well, I tell you what, and we, we might be three fourths of the way through practice and getting the yardage up there and. Um, if you want to get out, someone get up on the blocks. I give them a time, hit the time. We're going home. And uh, people were like, oh, but then like, like, yeah, when it wasn't them that I chose. So now they're all they're all behind a person. The team gets out and you get up on the blocks. I start them. Bingo, bango. They're going to get it in. If they hit the time, we're gone. If they don't hit the time, let's get back in. We're going to finish the workout. And uh, so I don't have any specifics. But uh, that was the test. Uh, and I believe in giving the test uh, to athletes and put them in a race condition to turn the switch on and see if they could step up and do it when they thought they were tired. And uh, at the time that we were doing those get out swims, um, I had a great group of national level kids uh, in, in the group. Uh, my training group was about 45 swimmers in a six lane pool starting at both ends. And out of 45 swimmers, at least 18 of them were going to nationals uh, when we really were getting it in. So uh, get out swims were they, they were major, big fun. Uh, if you weren't chosen, you know, then if you were chosen, it's time for you to step up. And your teammates were behind you uh, waiting for you to get the job done. So, uh, yeah, that, that was that was major. That was a test uh, of of. Uh, integrity, character, character building that I, I thought was essential. And to, you mentioned this before you mentioned that, um, when I was, uh, you mentioned it before you said that, uh, when, when your, <clears throat> when your stars graduated out, you went back to the age group program, right. which, which, which is so telling because when you're going to age group swimmers and you're developing them at that young age, it's like, this is entirely your creation. This it's a co-creative creation, but it's, yeah. this is a heavy lift age group coaches 
are the marrow of our sport. Right. But uh, Trevor brought up this. He goes, he goes, I think, I think it was 1988. He goes, something that sort of epitomizes the, the age groupers. He said, Greensboro, North Carolina trip, two chartered buses to show down with Greensboro Swim Association, which is that that's the, this is my stomping grounds. I was down in Charlotte. I, I've known Greensboro right. forever. And he, and he talked about Todd DeSorbo being a phenom. Todd, Todd DeSorbo is now, you know, NCAA championship coach, UVA. But Todd was this great phenom and swam breaststroke. Now, he, he, he went up against Wade. How do you say uh, Wade's first name? Atiba. Atiba. Atiba Wade. He went up against Atiba Wade in the breaststroke, according to legend. Todd decided he got beat so bad. He's decided never to swim breaststroke again. Can, do you have moments like that? where uh you had breakthrough swims breakthrough moments you could share with us oh, yeah we have a lot uh I, the, I didn't know how todd DeSorbe felt until really two years ago he was recruiting destin lasco so he comes up on the deck he introduces himself to me then he tells me who he really is and tells me about greensboro and i said oh wow uh and i said it was a fantastic trip and uh, I said, we swam out of our minds down there because the people treated us great. We didn't have a tent. We got down, it was hot. They had just finished some uh, recreational swim meets during the week. So they said, coach here, we, we, we were gonna take these tents down, but you can have them for the weekend. And that's all we needed. We were comfortable. So when Todd told me the story, I really fell out. And uh, he said, coach Ellis, I had to give up breaststroke after that. I thought I was the man. So yeah, we, we did that. And that young man in Tiba way had a national age group record stood for about 19 years. And uh, we had a, a relay team that was uh, around his age group uh, built around him and, and uh, three other guys that set a national age group record uh, for, for the relay. And then um, we moved up to junior nationals and uh, we, in Buffalo, we won, the 400 medley relay at juniors. And then we continued to three-peat that after three successive juniors after that. So that uh, became part of history. And um, I think the defining moments, we was in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We had uh, two backstrokers, Jason Webb and a guy named Chucky Cox. Uh, they went one, two in the backstroke qualifying in the morning at night and it switched around the other guy with number one the other guy's number two with both their swims qualified for olympic trials but we also had our relay down there and our relay just um we did some damage with our relay and uh it qualified uh for nationals as well so we had those moments uh because um that's what we were aspiring to so we had quite a few moments like that uh at nationals, I think we were Mission Viejo at nationals. And I had, um, I think Michael Norman, Chucky Cox, uh, Byron Davis, and Jason Webb. Byron Davis spent a little time with us. We met him. We felt we could help him out with his swimming, take him to the next level. And uh, I really got uh, eighth place. Uh, we were in uh, the Constellation Heat, and we won that. Me kind of got a little quiet after that, and uh, we saw people regrouping because uh, they were going to have to swim. And the first time that relay swam in nationals, uh, and I just posted that picture today on Instagram, we were at uh, Seattle, Washington. I think that's where we first saw you swimming for the million dollars they had in the lobby with the security guards. And uh, we were at the Weyerheiser place, and um, we swam well there, too, with our relay. We just were off of juniors. Uh, about a week before that, we came home, changed, packed, repacked, and flew to Nationals after that, and uh, took a team to Nationals. Uh, so we had those moments where uh, we did have a major impact, uh, especially when we three-peated down in, uh, uh, I think that was in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we had Jason Webb win the 200 back, Michael Norman win the 200 breast, and then my relay uh, three-peated down there. Uh, and I think they set a national record at that meet too. Uh, so we, we had quite a few moments in, in our career. If social media was around at the time, we probably would have blew up a little better than what we did, but we enjoyed the moment. I enjoyed the moment and um, uh, all the parents and the people in Philadelphia enjoyed the moment. 
I want to connect that success and, and bring that in a, in a straight line through present day because it, it's never ended. Uh, but I do want to stop and say that, you know, you, you've got to be proud of your, your PDR alum. The alumni are so impressive. We mentioned Trevor, managing director at Deutsche Bank. Uh, it's uh, Michael Norman, who's a, who's a fantastic coach in his own right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and but it's, it's to Kevin Hart swam for you also. You even got, you got, you got Hollywood stars. <laughs> <What's>, Kevin Hart. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> this guy, this guy's, this guy's a list. Yeah. Um, yes. But to, that, to, I mean, when you have these kids, you ever think, wow, they're going to go on and achieve success at the levels that they have because it's, it's pretty extraordinary. What is what the program was designed to do to take kids uh, and, and achieve. Okay, set the bar high, demand success, and once they're away from the pool, it's going to carry over into their everyday life. And uh, that was my mission. You know, I was a math teacher, and I wanted to make a mark. I wanted to influence people because I had a great life coming up, and um, I wanted to share that with other people and take them to the next level. So that that was part of our our atmosphere. That was the the way we we got up every morning. You know, your feet hit the ground, you better hit the ground running. And um, that's that's what it was. And the parents who sought me out were looking, they were looking for the same thing for their, their child. And they saw they got it at PDR. They got more than just the laps up and down the pool. They got what was happening outside the pool. They got as an educator, I'm wearing two hats, is youth development. You know, I want to see your child develop. And as an educator teaching high school, uh, I look for that. We see the psychology of that. We understand that. And so we want to bring it out in them without being detrimental. You know, a lot of people today say, oh, that's too hard. That's too tough. They need this. They need it. No. Kids are looking for you to lead the way, to be a leader. And um, my alumni, they appreciate it because they understood and they got comfortable with being uncomfortable with training. They made training fun. I mean, if you saw our workouts, uh, uh, getting it done, and at the time I was a proponent, <laughs> I was a proponent of laying it in because they're age groupers. Uh, and 80% of my work was their real big work. So it, it, it wasn't going to be detrimental to them. And my kids would tell you, sprinting the 50, we just used 50 as a benchmark to what your 100 was going to be when we were swimming the 1650 in practice for 500s. When I was doing your intervals, that's all I was using the 54. I, I didn't care about the 50. And, uh, you know, that was, that was about, unless you were muscle bound. I mean, I had a few good sprinters. And uh, people talked about Michael Norman, what he looked like. I mean, this guy was like cut out of stone. Uh, at 12 years old, he was that way. But Michael Norman, people don't understand when people say, oh, he'll be a great sprinter. And I, I said, well, we're going to check you off the list because you, you don't know what you're looking at. This boy can swim. And he swam and he trained. I mean, this this young man trained. Uh, and so that's what I asked of him. And so uh, they, they had no other way to go but up. And uh, we kept it very positive uh, in, in the program. And uh, they rose to the occasion. Uh, if I tell you what we did in, in yardage wise at some points, people say, nah, that ain't true. You know, that ain't true. You know, I want to uh, hear it. Tell me. Tell me. Give it up. Well, you know, like. Big meet, uh, when Chris Martin was training, he was, he was coaching up at Petty. And he had uh, Roy Sharp and all those guys up there. And there was a big meet at Princeton. Um, Eastern Express ran a meet, invitational. And a lot of people came, came to the meet. So uh, around November, I was making sure that we were up around 75, 80,000 yards a week. Okay. We were getting in nine sessions, nine sessions a week. And... Um, so by the time this meet came around, I just made sure that I was on a uh, rest cycle, you know? So we were still pounding yardage, but it wasn't 80 or 75. I just kind of dropped it down about 10%, but we kept getting it in and uh, they felt great. They were like, whoa, coach, something's wrong. We, we're not getting in 80, 90. We only got in about 65, 70. Well, everybody else was resting off of 60, 65 and 70. And we were just on cruise control. So consequently, we went to the meet. Uh, we put in some great performances because 
my end of the season meet was in April, March, you know? So why am I going to rest now major? I'll give them a little, I'll come up for air a little bit, but it's, it's about the work. And, uh, and they responded. They responded. People would not believe if they walked in the pool, the kind of work we were getting in because of the attitude of my swimmers was just great. They, they were competitive with each other. They demanded each other to step up. They had a lot of pride in the team and, and what it got them when they went to the meet. We had our swagger and we walked in with the swagger and that's the way we competed. Uh, so um, it, it was just a, a fantastic experience. And um, it, it's, it's, it's just what I did. I, I had a lot of mentors that I followed. I looked at a lot of programs. I looked at a lot of things in the country. You know, I read everything I could on Australia swimming uh, and, and I liked what they did. Uh, and I, I said, they must have been reading my playbook because my stroke technique and what I demanded as far as teaching swimming was the same, you know. And uh, then I read a lot on the sports institutes that they had in Eastern European countries and um, in the Asian countries. And uh, then I had, I had I had some of the greatest coaches in Philadelphia. You know, I mean, Frank Keefe, you know, how many times was he Olympic coach? You know, George Breen, world record holder. Uh, Dick Schulberg, you know, Germantown Academy. I mean, he was turning out swimmers and, and world record holders and Olympians, you know, forever. Bob Matson was down in Delaware. I was surrounded by great coaches. And if I was going to be successful just in my LSC, I had to step up to these guys. But they they opened their doors, they opened their log books to me, uh, and uh, I could see what they were doing compared to what I was doing, and um, so it was uh, it was very helpful in helping me formulate uh, my training regimentation. When I when I talk to uh, alumni, it's uh, I'm always I'm, I'm investigating a coach because a lot if if you, if a swimmer swims with a coach and then there there's the the connection is lost. Uh, I, I know what that coach is about. Uh, having the loyalty of your athletes uh, for a lifetime speaks volumes about you. And that's very clear in your case. Uh, your kids love you. They do. It's, um, I've, I've stood in circles and, 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 and heard the conversations. It's a, it's a genuine affection. But there's, there's something else that, 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 I, that I find that's interesting about you in particular is that a lot of clubs, and this isn't in, in all clubs, but a lot of clubs – there's this mentality of, okay, we're going to work hard and we're going to kind of suffer through the swimming and the club portion until we get to college and then it'll be fun. And uh, the feedback I got was that at PDR, it was fun. It was, they, it was cohesive. This was a team. Yeah. The college swimmers came back because they wanted to represent PDR. Right. Um, how, how did you create that sense, that kind of an atmosphere? Because that seemed to run counter and you had some more success than what other clubs were doing. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. And um, when people ask why I was so successful, that was part of it. Yeah, it was an atmosphere that when I started the team, that parents were going to be included in the program, in the process. Uh, other programs were, well, parents aren't allowed on the deck. We don't want them around. Why well, encourage the be parents to be on the deck or to sit in the stands to be to watch every practice? Because I wanted to be held accountable. And I wanted them to see what I was asking their child to do, or I wanted them to see what their child wasn't doing uh, right up front. And I had mandatory parent meetings uh, once a month. So uh, that, that was the lay of the land. We were building a team and a team was not just one or two superstar swimmers. It was the whole program. Everybody is here to work towards getting the team toward this goal. And I had a lot of parents that believed in that. And as we started moving up the ladder and started achieving faster and faster times, it became a party. You know, the parents loved it. We traveled well and uh, we, we stayed at the best places closest to the pool. I, I had uh, some things about traveling. We, we stayed at full service hotels. You know, we didn't stay far, far away. I mean, the extra money you save and staying far, far away, you're going to spend it doing something else. Full service hotel, put the kids to bed. You can sit around in the lounge and socialize, you know, then go to bed. Uh, if you stay in the lounge too long, another parent will take your kid to the meet. 
Uh, when we traveled, we traveled on buses. The parents had to travel on the buses with us. We used to go to Buffalo. We took three busloads of people to Buffalo. That's how we traveled. And I, I got that from my community in Pittsburgh when I grew up at uh, my high school. We had a great football team. And at the time, I didn't play football. I was in the marching band. But we had buses traveling to the football games throughout the city or at night. The city shut down. Now, I'm in Pittsburgh. In that community where I grew up, the city shut down. Everybody went to the game. Everybody supported the team, the players, the coaches. And uh, that was that was the history of our, our program in Pittsburgh. My swim team had a great medley relay. They went to states, qualified for states. I was the next man up like an alternate, but these guys ahead of me, upperclassmen, they kind of took me under the wing and said some things to me to help me out. But uh, they were that good. And so I wanted to create that atmosphere in the program. And um, like I said, the community, the parents, uh, everybody believed in what I was selling. They followed it and they had a great time. I mean, uh, yeah, you can't, I don't, I don't remember anybody not having a great time when we traveled. Uh, some people may push back on the way I traveled, but uh, when they got there, they said, well, you coach, great idea, you know, and they, they enjoyed it, but the swimmers enjoyed it. And, uh, it, it, it was a team. It was a cohesive team. And the, 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 the striving for excellence was almost like a, a fever. When I say, okay, our goal this year is to go to nationals. And kids who, who missed it felt like they were a failure. And I, I learned from that. I said, whoa. I had, to, I had to catch myself. I said, whoa. And I, I had to talk to those kids. I said, wait a minute. You hit 10 personal bests. You swim your all-time best. Okay, no, you didn't make juniors. Okay, you didn't make the, the national team, but you achieved. You're successful. So I, I, I had to, to roll that back into, into my program as well, and that everybody was special on the team. No matter what level you were swimming at, you're part of this team. You wear the same colors. You wear the same gear. And if we can, we go to the same meets. I made sure we went to meets where the whole team could go. And so uh, that, that was part of... Uh, my, my planning and uh, my administrating of the program. That was a, that was a masterclass in cohesiveness on, on teams because we, 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 I'm sure you we all know about it. There are no secrets in swimming. Everybody talks, right. but uh, club run programs, parent with, with parents can, the a coach's biggest gripe oftentimes is the relationship they have with the parents and there, and it ends up blowing up their careers, and now they they move from club to club to club. And uh, so, I hope that they drop in and listen on this podcast. I might learn a few things. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of people ask me about it, but I I, I created something, um, and it really became official when the movie came out, and I started doing motivational speaking. I created a triangle of accountability, which is the triangle is the strongest shape. And, uh, and, I, and anybody that joined the program, I told them, I'm accountable to you as a parent and I'm accountable to your child. The parent is accountable to me as a coach and to their child. Their child is accountable to the parent and to the coaching staff. And I said, without all three of those pieces, there's no success. You take one of them away, there's no success. And so that's something I, I stand by, still stand by, and uh, I preach constantly. And, um, and, and that, that's what worked. That's what worked because, uh, like I said, I wasn't a babysitter. I wasn't carrying your kid them down the highway. And your kid, when they had to swim in a meet, are going to have to be accountable to you. You know, you're paying the bills. And if you're not holding them accountable, then you're not doing your job as a parent. So uh, I, I, and my parents uh, enjoyed me. They didn't agree with everything I did. I said, we agree for you to disagree. But in the bottom line, I'm going to tell you what I feel is best for your child. And in the bottom line, you as a parent have to make the decision whether you're going to follow the program or not. And that's, that's the way it goes. It, it, tell me if this metric is correct. You've had an Olympic trials qualifier uh, at every trial since 92. Um, didn't in 16 and, uh, 
1992 well. up to 2000. And then after 2000, we kind of, we hit a law. We had lost of full time. We, we had some things that interrupted the program. Uh, for the last 10 years, I was with the Salvation Army building a pool, getting a brand new pool, but uh, it just didn't work in the culture and what I wanted to do with the community and what we could do with the facility that we had and me being employed uh, with them. So we, uh, we kind of separated, but we still use the facility and uh, we recreated and uh, revamped PDR uh, to get back into uh, the throes of things. And um, we were at Olympic trials this past time. We had a young man come from Atlantic City to train with us. The young man that we saw swimming at nine years old, when I first saw this young man swimming, I told everybody, I said, look, write this down in your logbook. You're looking at the next man. I mean, this boy was like, uh, I mean, I just stood there in awe watching this kid swimming 500 free. And I'm saying, he's the one. And, um, you know, I had a relationship with his family and I watched him grow, knew his coach. Had a good relationship with him. And then I got a phone call. He wanted to train with us. And um, I had to pause and hang up and tell him, call me back, you know, and uh, think about it. Uh, it was it was major. And I had him get them to think about driving from Atlantic City to Philadelphia every day. That was major. And, um, yes, I knew him as an observer. But you know how it is. It, you're coaching. You say, oh, if I had that kid, I would do this, this, and this. But you don't really know what, what baggage people have with them. You don't know what they bring with them, why. You know, you, you see them, you say, oh, this kid could be great, but you don't know why they're not. Something's missing. So I said, do I really want that? But the challenge was to work with a kid this talented was a challenge of a lifetime. So that got us back to Olympic trials uh, this past year. And uh, so that yeah, was so you, that's his name, Dustin Lasko. Dustin Lasko. Dustin Lasko. So yeah. Lasko, and if uh, and and he's he's so consistent, he's just so consistent. The uh, last NC two A is the eye popping swim for me at the NC two A championships. Where I, I rolled over and was explaining it to my wife, who's not a swimmer. I was like, he went a one thirty five ninety nine two hundred backstroke, forty four four nine hundred back. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. He had it in him. Uh, and really, I think he's the best plant. I think he's the best swimmer on the planet. I don't think he realizes it yet what he has with him. Uh, but I think he's and he has all the strokes. We did a lot of work. And uh, when people really get to see him swim in the IM, maybe uh, they'll realize it. But this young man is has a great feel for the water. He has a work ethic that's unreal. And sometimes it's a little too unreal. Uh, I think our biggest challenge was to get him to turn the race mode switch on more often, you know. Um, and uh, other than that, and I've had some great athletes. I'm telling you, I'm not just swimmers. I had athletes. This young man is the top of the heap. So that's how we got back to Olympic trials. But 92, we had a young man who was 16 years old. He was the youngest swimmer. I think uh, Hudapol, Joe Hudapol was at that meet, was 16 as well. Had a great 200. And um, we were at that meet. That was an indie. And so we were in there and did all the indie uh, meets after that. Uh, I had a young lady who was 16, the Olympic trial, a young lady named Brielle White. She went to University of Virginia. She was top 20 in the world uh, when she swam Olympic trials. Her first 50 meter was on world record pace. I was like, I think we're out a little too fast. And uh, by the time by the time she got to the 75 meter mark, I was looking for something to pull her into the wall with. But to get there, but we got a nice swim off of that. And she was another athlete that was swimming. She was uh, one of four sisters that swam. And uh, this young lady came along and uh, really, she didn't know how good she really was. I mean, for us, for me to tell her she was top 20 in the world, it just, really, really, you know, I don't think she really got it, but uh, she was, she was another great athlete because she, she could swim more than backstroke. Uh, my kids are asked to swim all, all strokes. 
Uh, that's what we do in the program because it gives you variety in your workout. If you're not swimming IM with age groupers, yeah, you kind of got get some stale workouts, you know. It's um, this Dustin Lasco. We got to say this. He's he is he is on the path. He's checking the boxes. He's dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Because in our modern age, of course, um, you're a little boy. He's a little boy. He's still so very young. He's not a man yet. Thank you. And that's that's what I realized once they they were on the deck with me regular. But I'm saying, oh, I have to change. I told his parents, I said, well, I, I had one training program for him. I got to change. I have to change. I said, because he's a baby. I said, he's a baby. I said, I said, oh, my goodness, he's a baby. So that that people get a false impression when they see him physically, his physical uh, appearance. But if they really get a chance to talk to him, he's a kid. I was like, oh, my goodness. So I, I had to backtrack a little bit and regroup training. And uh, but some of the things he did were unbelievable. My alumni came back to watch. I had a deck full of alumni swimmers, you know, I just like this kid is dick coach. What you got for him today? So I had to let him look at my workout and they're like, oh, my goodness, this is a good one here. Oh, wow. He's doing this. And um, I, I just feel. I don't know if I said it to you when we were talking Olympic trials. I was kind of in a little funk there. Uh, I, I just felt that um, he was going to hit the number that I felt was going to take to make the team. I, I just think that he had it. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, if we had trials when they were supposed to have it, we might have been had a different scenario. But, you know, I lost him for seven months. He was out there with uh, Cal. And so it's that brings in some other things, but uh, he'll wake up and get it. He'll wake up. If he doesn't, then I don't know what's up. Coming from a strong college club program and going into a college program, um, changing that environment is, is tough. It's tough. Yeah. I went through a transition. My, my freshman year was flat and yeah. it was, uh, it takes some adjustment, uh, some collaboration between the coaches and to get everything right. But uh, my, yeah, my, I, 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 I share your opinion. I yeah, share well, your... <laughs> if, if ever talking to college coaches, I think I spoke to uh, Cal coaches more than I ever spoke to any other college coaches. Uh, just trying to not overstep my bounds, not try to interfere too much, even when, when Destin and I spoke on the phone, uh, but to try to remind him of where he came from, what he did to get where he was. And um, uh, I think he woke up when he swam the 200 back because I, I kind of chewed him out after 200 IM. I chewed him out after something else. But after the 200 back, I couldn't get him off the phone. I mean, he just, uh, he, he, he himself was just like, coach. Coach, I mean, he just the record, you know, and he's the third, third fastest time all time. And um, I think that uh, that was one of the things that probably I thought was going to get him over the hump, you know, to going after the Olympic team. Uh, but he'll be there. He'll be there. But he, I've been blessed. And, and, and we got another one coming up super fast. Um, yes, at three years. Three years. As I've held you a little longer than I than I told you I'd hold you, but I I did have a couple of questions here at the end. Go ahead. Um, just from just from a standpoint, you know, what does the future hold for you? You got fifty years going now. Well, what's what you still looking ahead? What what's what's in store for the future? What what keeps you motivated? You don't get old and retire. When you retire, you get old. So I'm not going anywhere, brother. And uh, at this stage of the game, uh, after coming back from Olympic trials and um, I turned around and I looked in my program and I said, OK, you, 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 you. OK, three years from now, we're going to be on a deck at Olympic trials. So I have a group of 12, 13, 14 year old uh, young age groupers that I have a three year program mapped out and um we're going to be at Olympic trials three years from now. That, that's what it holds for me. Uh, uh, that, that, that's my goal. That, that's, that's what it is. And um, that's what I'm setting out to do. And uh, we're on, we're on uh, pace for that, you know? So uh, 
like I told you, I do what I love and I love what I'm doing. So uh, as long as I have swimmers who come in and parents who come in and follow the program, who, who want what I'm giving them, you know, I'm going to be there, God willing. Uh, that, that's what it holds. I like the action. I'm a junkie for the action. I like fast swimming. But more importantly, I enjoy the journey. Uh, and, and if a lot of people understand the journey, uh, I think they'll get more out of the sport. Uh, the, the everyday practices and just, you know, seeing a kid every 10, 15 days make an improvement or when you start doing your test sets and you're recording your test sets and you, you see them improving or they start asking you different questions, uh, you know, you're, you're reaching them and um, their, their stroke technique as they get stronger. Um, because you said something about college swimming and, and one of the things in my program and I told people, I said, well, we, we, no, we're not throwing weights around. Said, these are young, these are these young adolescents. But we do do dry land. We do flexibility. I said, but I want them to have a career past me. I want them to have a career. I want to give them the best cardiovascular system. I want to give them the best mental focus that's possible that when they move on from me and go to college, they're going to say, hey, I'm in my prime. This is what I do. And they'll swim for the rest of their life if they want to. I want to just develop them to where they can go down the road and continue a career, you know, uh, after they leave me and uh, enhance it. Because once they mature, especially young men, 22, 23, 24, okay, you can throw the weight around, uh, just not too much at too much one time, but you can throw it around and uh, the young ladies will be ready. So uh, that, that's part of my philosophy. Uh, if my kids are successful early, fine. And we were very successful getting 16-year-old young men at nationals. Uh, I think I took six guys to nationals in Minnesota, and we scored in the top 10. It was a soft nationals, but our men were making uh, night swims. We were scoring points and uh, took our relay. And uh, to be in the top 10 is nice. We went to juniors in Michigan, and uh, I think I took 18 swimmers there. We swam every event. We were getting it in. Both and, sexes. Uh, you but both. I know about this moment. Both sexes. Every event. You had someone. You had someone. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> impressive. Yeah, it was an impressive meet, and um, uh, I, I felt good about the meet. Not only about what our kids did in the pool, but at the time, our band check was doing the um, the color coding of our energy systems. You know, the white, the pink, the red. And he he, he held a session on that, and when I sat and listened to him. Uh, and I'm saying, well, I already do that, you know? And so it was just a confirmation that what I was doing was right on point. So I knew we were ready to swim after that. Uh, and again, because I read a lot, I read a lot about a lot of things. And when John and I talked, he said, well, what else do you read, Jim? Where, where'd you get that from? What, what's going on? Well, I don't know. I can't tell you that, John, I'm just, but I'm going to read. But I, I, I really felt that he was one of the greatest coaches that we had out in developing uh, athletes. Uh, there, there are a lot of coaches. Uh, I think Reese was kind of looking at what I do. You know, I like the way his, his swimmers from the 200 free. And I think that's probably one of the biggest thorns on my side. I love the 200 free. I think it's one of the greatest events. I love 200 meter free. And I think that's what's happening. And I really would like to have me a 200 meter freestyle swimmer make a national uh, team like that. Uh, that, that would be great. And um, I think Americans are soft on that event uh, in meters. Uh, so um, our men, we need to get it going. Uh, so what, what's more painful, a 200 meter free or a 200 meter butterfly? Probably 200 meter free. 200 meter free is more, I swam both races and I always told people, I said, 200 meter free hurts far. If you swim it correctly, the 200 meter free should be the most painful thing you can experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, on a butterfly. People get confused. I tell people 200 butterflies cake. I said 200 butterflies is just rhythm. I said, it's rhythm and time. I said, you get the rhythm down. You can swim 200 butterfly all day long. I said, people are fooling you. That's not hard. They look at it. <laughs> I said, you know, I, I could just kind of say it's all about the rhythm and that uh, I'll take the two breasts a little harder than the two fly. Cause Breaststrokers lose their legs. They're gone. They're dead meat. You know, uh, that's another event I love. And 
I, I was fortunate to have Michael Norman come in the program and he fit. He, he was a perfect fit for my philosophy on breaststroke and the things that a breaststroker needs to have and uh, the style of breaststroke that I, that I, I saw being successful looking at people like uh, Steve, L- Steve Lundquist and uh, people in, in the earlier years, uh, Jenny Frank swimming the IM and uh, people like that. I, I just extracted things that fit my philosophy and uh, kind of created my own that I was looking for. So I, 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 was, I had a lot of talent uh, in, in my career and I continue to get talent that comes in uh, the program. So it allows me, they make me look good. I'm not a good coach. The swimmers just make me look good. You're teasing. You're a great coach. The, uh, so I, I, in closing out, I have, there's some backstory to this uh, and I'll, and I'll just get right into it and I'll, and I'm going to share a fear with you. And um, we, it, it involves a mutual a fear, friend. A fear. Yeah, a fear, personal fear. You know, we all deal with our fears, you know? Uh, so I, I left swimming after my career was over and I had another career and I wasn't happy in the career. And I started to move back to swimming. My wife said, get back into swimming at your family. You love it. Right. So I started making inroads and, uh, and, and about 2000, between 2005, 2007, I was talking to my friend Rowdy Gaines and I said, what is, you know, what's going on in the sport? What's the single most important issue? And it was about 2007 goggles when I came right. back. And we, you know, I had the pre-events and the parties and the screening of your film, but this was what was loaded in my head. My mentor, Rowdy Gaines said, Mel, the single most important issue is that in our sport, he said, he said, we, he goes, we are way too white. We do not look, our sport does not look like the breakdown of the United States and and we've, we've grown year over year, but if we don't change it, we're going to start to shrink. Yeah. And that scared me to know that the sport that I love so much could shrink, um, frightened me. And uh, as we stand talking today, we're 1% black, 6% mixed. We are still way off. Right. And uh, if we want to grow, this is it. This is what we do. Now, now yeah. a lot of people have opinions on how to get there. Uh, you, you might not have the answer, but. Is this something you think about? Is this something that you're like, something, do you have ideas that meet that maybe everybody else should think about? Well, uh, you know, that's a fantastic question. And um, uh, I've been fortunate enough that, uh, and I, I told this to Tim Henchy uh, when I finally got to meet him. Um, CEO of right. USA Swimming. Okay. Right. Some people won't know that. Okay. Yeah, that I've been very fortunate that US, US, I had USA Swimming's ear. You talked about Mike Unger. I watched him come up in the sport for 28 years at USA Swimming. And there are other people at USA Swimming that said, okay, Jim, what's up? You know, a Bob Steele, we're running our first uh, outreach camp. And uh, I, we had some ideas about it. Well, you're sending information back, but the coaches don't understand the information. They had the flume out there at the time. I said, and they may not be able to break down what we're sending them. Stroke rate, stroke count, this and that. I said, why don't we bring the coaches out there as well? When you bring the swimmer, you bring the coach too. So we had a track for the coaches, track for the swimmers. USA Swimming did it. But we didn't get the results once the coaches went back home. We didn't see an uptake on national level kids. So we tried some other ideas. So I I just felt that I was fortunate that I could say that. But one of the things that I I think that, especially with the pandemic has brought out, is urban programs that are part of uh, municipalities that depend upon municipal pools and facilities. We've been shut out. Uh, my pool has been closed off and on for so, so long and everybody else is swimming around them and uh, getting the pool time, uh, it, it really showed its, its head during the pandemic. During my 50 years of career, I've always had a pool. I've had unlimited pool time. I could program in training whenever I need it. And I had that 99% of the time. Most programs don't have that. And I've had decent facilities, not great, but decent facilities. Most of them were brand new when I had them and they kind of got run down when we got finished with them, but I had that. Uh, I think the other thing is highlighting. And this is what I try to do when people were interviewing me. Don't interview me for a human interest story. Interview me because the sport of swimming. 
We'll take Simone Manuel, for example, great athlete, Olympic gold medalist. I just don't think she got the publicity and her story was told enough and it wasn't told enough the right way that she could be a good role model for other young kids coming up, for other young coaches coming up to tell her story. A lot of people don't know she didn't swim high school. She just swam USA Swimming growing up as a young person. I started following her when she was around 12. And uh, I, I, for the parents to do that, because most parents want their kids swimming high school and getting that instant gratification, swimming a 50. And I said, OK, that's good, swimming 100. But how many are going to move on and be able to do it over and over and over again at the big level meets? So I, I just think that and with Tim and I talking about and some of the changes Tim has brought with him to USA Swimming, that we might be turning that corner. But the other thing is, and, and I say this to a lot of people, why would African-American swimmers want to swim anyways? There's no raw models. Okay, well, why do they want to swim? Okay, well, 80% of people are still in pools that, other, you know, those kids don't even see. I mean, you go, to, you go down to, like I said, you go down to Potomac Valley Swimming, there's nothing but great pools. You go to North Carolina, everything I, I swam in, that was a great pool. You know, I live in Philadelphia, and we're looking for pools. And, and so, again, we have to make it uh, something that they want to do, uh, that, you know, Okay, you, you, you're six foot six, but you're not good at basketball. Try swimming. You know, if we get them early enough, young enough, and create that environment. The other issue is the sport is just so tough. Yeah, you know I mean, I, I don't care how you slice it, how you kind of trying to make it attractive to people. Once you get up to that upper 10, 20 percent, it, it's a different ball game. Uh, but just on a grassroots level, learning to swim, major. That's major. Everybody should learn how to swim. And I think as umbrella organization, you'll say swimming needs to push that. They're doing it. We do have the foundation. OK, I, I think it, it's starting to reach out a little bit more. They see some inroads being made, but I, I think more can be made. Um, we do have a uh, program where I've been mentoring some coaches uh, over the past couple of years. And now we have some community swim programs in major cities that are coming on board that is being supported by USA Swimming. And uh, they have large numbers of swimmers. And uh, they have coaches who have been there. Uh, I think Bob Grosseth is involved with that. He was a Northwestern coach. So he was out in Chicago area. And uh, he's been around. He's a doc councilman guy. You know, he grew up under doc. You know, so he's got that, that background. But uh, I just think access to good pools, uh, where the environment's good. I think the environment's important to sell swimming, especially in our community. Uh, having access to that, having access to, to great coaches that really want to swim at that level. I think it, 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 a lot of people are afraid of that because uh, you asked me what am I doing next? And I, I'm, I'm looking at where are the qualifying times for next Olympic trials. And that's what's on my wall. Uh, you know, is, is uh, sectionals on my wall? No, 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 no. Is juniors on the wall? Yeah, because that's going to get you to nationals, which is going to get you to Olympic trials. And so I, 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 people look at me, they say, well, what about all these other meets? I said, well, what about them? You know, I said, you, if, if you're going for my goals, you'll hit that in practice along the way. So uh, I, I just think setting goals high and uh, putting it out there and believing in it, uh, it, it those are some of the things. Uh, that are happening. And plus, I was a junkie. I, like I told you, I read anything and everything on swimming. Uh, when I made the national uh, trip list and I went to Australia, I was in heaven. Uh, got down there, got off the plane, and somebody knew me in Australia. I was like, you know me? And uh, so uh, that, that, was, that was unique. And um, uh, same thing when I went to the UK, someone knew me and uh, knew about what we were doing. Uh, that, that was very fulfilling for me that I was making some kind of inroads. But uh, I, I think we're making progress. Uh, there are a lot of great swimmers around the country. Uh, again, I, I don't think there's enough programs that come out of uh, the metropolitan area. Like I said, uh, uh, my team was known as a black swim team. Uh, I, I created to get as many African-Americans in there. And I like to say uh, a new pool of talent. 
Okay. I was in an area where there was no swim team before, no coach was coming there looking for athletes. So I had to pick it a litter, so to speak. And uh, the more kids I ran through, the more athletes I was going to find. So I think we need more grassroots programs uh, to get the job done uh, because there are a lot of great athletes that can swim that will help the sport. Uh, and uh, I just think that's uh, what's needed uh, tremendously. Even in Africa, I mean, Africa, you don't see people of color swimming in Africa. I, I, I'd love to get over to Africa, see what they got. You know, if they got the, the uh, Africans running the, the steeplechase, the mile, whatever, I might be able to get me a couple of miles out of Africa, you know? Uh, but yeah, I just, I, I just don't look at the limitations. Now, uh, I tell people, I never talk about what I don't have. I work with what I got. Right now, I have five days of practice. I'm using a YMCA pool in Philadelphia that's uh, uh, renting me time while our pool is being repaired. And uh, we make the best of what we have. And I, I, I gear my program to what I have right now, where I'm going to go. In January, things will change. So I'll be on my third cycle for the year. And uh, we'll, we'll go through that. But uh, I'm in the next summer already. I see these kids already next summer. So I, I just think that people just need to be more aggressive, more positive about what's happening. And um, just we, we just we just want to get the best talent pool that we could put um, out there. Uh, I was surprised that we didn't have too many 19 year old young men being competitive at Olympic trials. Uh, I looked around the world and I watched trials from uh, European championships, Australia. I looked at everything. So this, this, this internet channel, this uh, was, it's called Swim Swam. They put everything on there. So I could go there, sit down. I could listen to the Russians. Uh, I didn't speak Russian, but I could watch their, their championships. And I saw a lot of young teenage boys being competitive. And I, I feel we missed a boat in America with that. I don't know whether it was college swimming or the club coaches not thinking they're good enough to compete with the college uh, teams. Uh, developmental wise, I mean, you're talking about young adolescents competing against men, but we have some young talented swimmers that are out there that can do the job. And I just felt we could have been a little bit more competitive uh, with that. Uh, but uh, the sport is coming. Uh, they're, they're changing. We would like to see the change quicker. I would. I'm getting older, you know, but uh, I, I've been very blessed to have that relationship with USA Swimming and all the people there. I could pick up the phone. They would answer my phone call, answer my questions. I could get pretty much what I want from them for as information. And uh, I think that uh, that's one of the things that helped me become successful. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.